So reminders, um, first of all, I released the uh, final homework, which is different from the uh, homeworks you had uh, before. It's uh, something you will need to do uh, on paper and uh, there is no programming involved. You'll need to open a demo and look at some uh, dependency and constituency parse tree, but um, you, you don't need to uh, implement your own um, parse tree. Um, any, any questions about that homework? Yeah, it should be fairly straightforward, I hope. Yeah. I, I would prefer if you write it on a computer, uh, just because your handwriting usually is not the best. So we want to avoid situations where we say, OK, we can't read this, and we penalize you for it. And maybe you have written something that's correct. Uh, so yeah, I ask in the homework to type it out. Um, I recommend using uh, LaTeX. It's the easiest to have a nice, clean text, but any editor you like will work for us. Yeah. Um, I feel like I want to say something else. Yeah, the reason why I decided to not make this a programming assignment is because you should be working on your projects and, uh, you know, working on two different code bases might be uh, distracting. In terms of the projects, um, I hope uh, by now you should really have uh, decided on which one of the three options you are going to work on. And if you are working on an open research or reproducing a paper, you should have pretty solid idea of what um, you kind of are set uh, set up yourself to do. Um, ideally, you also have done some literature review. You know what data, what baselines you have, uh, and uh, you are on the right track. In the if you're choosing to work on the data artifacts, um, you should have or you know chosen a data set you are going to work on and a model you're going to work on. And I think already working on a part one, you should start doing that. Like you should be finding a way to find those uh, data artifacts. So if you're working on the option three, please don't you know forget that. Yeah, this should be taking also more time than your first homework. So uh, yeah, start working on all of that soon. I reached a uh, few of you reached out about whether your project idea makes sense. Keep doing that. If you're unsure, I'm happy to assist you. All right. Any questions about the logistics? Nice. Okay. So just a moment. Today, we are going to move away from uh, syntax uh, and syntactic parsing, which was the way for us to determine whether you know, if sentence is uh, grammatical and to find syntactic structure of a sentence. And today, we are going to talk, um, today's lecture is going to be all about uh, meaning or uh, the study of linguistic meaning, which is called semantics. So semantics examine what meaning is, how words get their meaning and how the meaning of a complex expression depends on its part. And we have mentioned semantics before when we were talking about word embeddings. Uh, specifically, we were talking about lexical semantics, where you care about semantics of individual words. But now we are going beyond just words, and we are interested in the semantics of a whole uh, expression, which can be, for example, an utterance, a sentence. And when we talk about um, meaning and semantics, it's important to make distinction between senses and references. Um, sense is given by the ideas and concepts that are associated with an, uh, an expression and can be, a, you know, we can mention things that we know in the world and use something like common sense, for example, um, where reference is the object to which an expression points. And um, you will also see when we mentioned briefly uh, discussions about form versus uh, meaning. For example, when ChatGPT outputs a sentence, these are actual words we see, and they are just a form. Um, but what whether the model actually has understanding of the meaning behind those words is a is another question. Um, Important is also that lang to know that, oh, excuse me, that language is underspecified and we don't say many things, but we assume uh, that the other person might know all these missing steps, uh, such as, you know, when you get a menu at a restaurant, no one needs to spell you out like 
yeah, you're going to choose something and then there is a cook behind who will actually cook this food and then this food will be given to uh, staff and staff will bring it to you. And unlike syntax, where we did have, you know, we, we talked about there are different formalisms and uh, these formalisms, maybe they differed, but they could capture a lot of what, what we actually wanted. Uh, there are no standard semantic formalisms. Uh, it's way harder to formalize semantics. Um, we have some um, some ideas about how we should present uh, the meaning of uh, expressions using, for example, predicate logic in language predicate uh, will be whatever is tied connected to the verb, as we have seen with the uh, syntactic trees. Um, in some very restrictive works, we will have first order logic. Some people will use a graph to represent uh, some meaning of the sentence. Um, but some people will say, well, that, that's too, again, restrictive and can't you know handle all of the things we want. So instead, we should be framing um, uh, for example, uh, finding a bunch of questions that answering these questions will give us information about the meaning of a piece of text. Um, and whatever we have right now is usually specific to English language. So semantics is way more difficult to formalize because there are just so many phenomena that are tied to semantics. Think about, I don't know, sentiment that we have seen. That's a part of meaning of a sentence if sentiment is expressed in text. But metaphor, rhyme, irony, all of that is uh, relevant for semantics. So what we are going to do today is we are first going to introduce the task of uh, semantic parsing. And I will give you a um, presentation of semantic parsing at, as it, um, you know, the way it was looked at in 2018. And uh, then we are going to move into something called shallow semantic parsing. And what those things are will become clearer in a moment. So semantic parsing is a task where we want to convert a natural language into a logical form, excuse me, um, or a program, whatever is a machine understandable representation of the, me of the meaning. And then usually people don't say this maybe explicitly, you will see this definition of semantic parsing, but semantic parsing in NLP means that you also have some kind of executor that will take that formal representation of the meaning and do some kind of uh, operation that, that will then give you a result, a response that you actually want. So although you have this you know, definition of what semantic parsing is, very often you also assume that you have executor that will give you a response. Important here is that meaning representation should be some formal structure. I think it's easiest for you as computer scientists to think about uh, representation being something like logic. And it should capture the complete meaning of um, linguistic expression. And what is complete, although people throw this word and you'll see it in papers, um, it's actually not super formally defined. And it's quite debatable what complete meaning means. Um, I think in terms of semantic parsing, complete, you can think about it when you have executor, it is a representation of meaning that has everything you need to actually be able to execute whatever that uh, first sentence is telling you to do. Um, but then, you know, as we have mentioned before, if we, you know, take a step back and we don't think about, okay, nothing has to be executed. We just want to have a formal representation for the sake of having a formal representation. Then different linguists will disagree on what complete meaning actually uh, is here. And to give you an example of you know, what a semantic parser might do and how this meaning representation might look like, you might have uh, built uh, semantic parsers for the task of question answering. And uh, you know, right now you can ask a question to chat GPT and might give you answer and you might be aware that, okay, this model has some hallucinations, so it's not always trust, you know, trustworthy uh, in terms of getting the right answer. You also might be aware, okay, uh, to use ChatGPT, I need a paid API, so I need to always spend money. Um, okay, maybe there are some open source versions, but that requires knowing and having knowledge of how to you know, download the weights and um, have a wrapper code that will actually prompt this model. 
Um, so you might opt for something simpler. Maybe your question answering task is very narrow, very constrained. You are not asking questions about anything in the world. You might be just um, interested in locations and um, information about certain locations. And you have a database, for example, all the big cities in the US gave their, their uh, databases about information about their population. All these databases have exact structure. You can merge them together. And now you have a database that gives you basic statistics of uh, certain cities in the US. Here, you might decide then to deploy this semantic parsing approach where your semantic parser needs to give you some kind of uh, formal representation of this input sentence that says how many people live in Seattle. And because you're going to uh, execute that form, that formal representation over database, you might decide, well, I'm going to use SQL to represent my input sentence. And then the sentence, how many people live in Seattle, will be turned into select population from city data where city equals uh, Seattle. So this is, in this case, this um, uh, excuse me, meaning a representation of your sentence. And now you can execute that uh, query over your database because now this, this problem basically turns into programming. And from that, you will get uh, an answer you were interested in. Another example, which is very common, is in robotics, where you might have instructions and such as go to the third junction and take a left. Um, and here again, um, you might use a BERT representation and then maybe your robot may uh, work with, uh, you know, distributional representations with high dimensional vectors that are dense and whose dimension don't, don't have meaning. But in current, at least, uh, robots likely don't have, um, you know, they have very primitive grammar and very primitive instructions that they can follow. So you might think, okay, it's really an overkill to now here use some kind of very complex representation of language when the instructions themselves are pretty simple and can be broken down in primitives that the robot can understand. So again, here, let's say someone had developed a, a grammar for this uh, robot. We can write uh, this um, instruction into a sequence of operations such as, uh, you know, move forward, until you come to the junction and then turn right. And then uh, because the robot is designed such that he understands these instructions written in this programmatic way, he can actually execute that uh, operation. All right, the issue with semantic parsing is that the data we have typically comes with inputs and outputs. So here you might have go to the third junction and take a left. And then you have where the robot is, like this snapshot of the environment, and then where the robot should end, which would be over here. So imagine you have another image and then the robot is over here. Or with uh, this example, we have sentences, questions, how many people live in Seattle, and we have corresponding answers, but we do not have this uh, SQL way of framing this question. So these programs or formal representations are what we say hidden or latent. We keep using this word when you miss certain uh, information. And note that um, when you wanna collect data, it's way easier for people to answer these questions or to show where a robot should end over here rather than writing all of these uh, you know, formal logical way of um, how the rep how to represent the input. So if you ask a cry worker, show me where the robot should end, they can easily, no matter their you know um, educational level or whatever understanding of anything, they can very likely point you to where this robot should end. But if you ask them, but okay, here is a grammar that this robot can understand. Now write to in this grammar how exactly you know it should be programmed to follow this instruction. Well, then you might require, you know, a high schooler not necessarily needs to do that, where the first uh, example I've given you, they, they can point where the robot should end. So the issue with semantic parsing is that these programs, these formal representations are latent. And for a while, to kind of circumvent that, we have used uh, CCG, uh, which is a, is a grammar, um, you know, we mentioned 
before we have seen context-free grammars, we have seen probabilistic context grammars, uh, we have seen uh, how to do uh, parsing on top of these grammars and so on. So think about CCG as another uh, grammar, but here grammar that ju doesn't just look at the um, relationship between words, it also looks at these, uh, you know, uh, the, the words themselves as well. And we will not go into the details of CCG uh, because it is one of these things that has been, um, you know, replaced by neural approaches. But up to the 2016, and here in the quote by Mark Johnson, which is a, a famous NLPer, this was the classic approach to do semantic parsing. And then, like, um, yeah, just a moment uh, before I make another point. The the issue with CCG is that. These grammars are difficult to engineer and a uh, few people can do it and it takes a ton of time. So, um, you know, you would build some kind of complex discrete learning algorithms on top of it. The whole thing is very complex, right? And partly a reason why I'm skipping it today such that we learn some other things. Um, excuse me. And, um, okay, um, I'm missing a slide here. What I wanted to say here, and maybe it comes later for some reason, is that uh, this approach has been replaced by neural sequence-to-sequence -sequence approaches that we have seen, um, you know, uh, before. Sorry about that. Um, there is another another thing with, that I wanted to show. But um, after 2016, instead of using CCG for parsing, instead we would use sequence-to-sequence -sequence approach, where input would be a sentence such as how um, how many people live in Seattle. And the output would be that SQL query that I've shown you. So you trace the model to translate from uh, questions, inputs, whatever we have, sentences into these uh, forms, logical forms that the model can then uh, execute. Um, which of course means that we need data and we will come to data in a moment. Uh, but I also wanna highlight that um, unlike with machine translation, um, or maybe machine translation is not a great uh, example. So we use seek, seek to seek approach for many things, such as let's say summarization. We're given an input document, you want to produce a summary, but you have flexibility about how you want to express yourself when you write that summary. Like there isn't really one way to summarize text, right? Like we all, uh, if we spend enough time, if I given you a document, we might produce many different summaries and they will likely all be pretty good. And, but they will differ in words we use to express ourselves, especially if we, if I instruct you to not use a really extractive approach, rather abstractive where you allow to use words that are not in the input document. However, with, um, you know, using sequence to uh, seek to seek approach to uh, produce these logical forms, we don't have this flexibility, right? Like there is very formal way of producing this logical form and likely there is a single one of them. There isn't like multiple ways. We should be writing something uh, in, this, uh, in this formalized uh, representation of the input. So when we use sequence to sequence approach, um, to generate those, you know, SQL queries or those robot instructions that I have shown you, we need to be careful with what we are uh, doing at the decoding time. And for this, I will use another example of semantic parsing, which is the uh, task where you want to uh, answer questions given a table. So you are given a table, and you need to answer a question where you need to understand the table to be able to answer the question. And here the question is, uh, which athlete was from South Korea? after 2010, and um, you would need to produce this program, which says, okay, first to reverse these um, athletes and find the nation South Korea, and then uh, find the year uh, after 2010, for example. So this is an example of a program you would need to then be able to something else to execute that program and find you the answer, uh, which is here, uh, Kim Yuna, I believe, yeah. All right, so here, if we approach this as a sequence to sequence problem, we find some way to represent the table. That's not super important for us because uh, we are not talking about, the point is not to learn how to do this uh, question answering when you're given a table. So imagine some way of linearizing table and giving it to the uh, model. At the time, uh, these LSTMs were state of the art. We have learned about transformers, so here, 
just uh, have transformer instead of LSTM written to ground into the something you are more familiar with, but the everything else stays the same, especially in the decoding part where here, these are the words in your vocabulary. Uh, reverse, athlete, argmax, and 2010 nation brackets, right? Um, and the thing with the semantic parsing is that, uh, well, because the um, what we can generate is so constrained, uh, then in the first step, we can't generate anything but a bracket because in this language um, or in this formalism where we are trying to produce, you always must start with the opening bracket. So all of these other possibilities in your vocabulary are not a thing for first uh, step in your decoding. Uh, and similarly later here in uh, red color are all the words that you should not be generating and in a uh, very bright green is the word you should be uh, generating, although there are some other possibilities. So what we have seen here at the first glance is that there is a lot of red, right? Uh, it's um, a lot of things shouldn't be generated. So sequence to sequence approach applied to semantic parsing needs to have constrained decoding. So you want to avoid uh, generating tokens that are not allowed under the formalism where that you are trying to uh, produce a formal representation of your input. And basically there are two ways to do that. You can do the so-called token-based or grammar-based decoding. Um, token-based decoding is a very simple idea and maybe the first thing, thing that came to your mind where you um, forbid uh, outputting what is not allowed at the current position. So if you, are, if you know here that nothing but opening bracket will be um, um, allowed, why would you sample anything else? You just sample the opening bracket and you move to the next step and here, okay, maybe you just need to forbid the closing bracket and everything else can be uh, um, generated, which is fine. But then when you come to here, you can set the probabilities of all the words that are um, of the logic, sorry, unnormalized logics of all the words that can, should not be generated can be put to minus infinity. So when you have, uh, softmax over these two remaining value that will normalize, um, uh, you know, they, they are the only values that will have values that are not strictly zero. Uh, and uh, the sum of their probabilities will sum to one. Um, so you can do that super simple. Another approach people have uh, proposed is the grammar-based decoding, where instead of uh, producing the actual tokens, you, you say what kind of rule in your grammar had you uh, deployed to generate uh, that to, to generate the token. So here is an example and uh, the part I want you to focus on uh, is over here. This is what the, uh, the decoder is generating. So instead of generating the actual logical forms, so see here, we have the same example, bracket, bracket, reverse, at least so on. Instead of generating at the first position, the opening bracket, it will uh, it will generate a rule, which here is C. I don't know what exactly it stands for, but maybe it stands for open or start, let's say. And then in the next step, you instead of generating another you know, bracket, you will generate this rule that says, from C, uh, do this uh, thing R with C. Uh, again, I don't know what exactly is this reference to, but this is the um, this is the rule under this grammar that will then produce the second opening uh, bracket. So that's a uh, another way to approach the decoding where you disallow the model to generate um, tokens that are not allowed under the grammar by not even generating the tokens themselves, but rather the rules under the tokens. Okay, so here are just a bunch of references for both of these uh, approaches. If you are uh, interested to uh, see more, this figure over here is taken by from uh, this paper uh, that's uh, by uh, uh, these authors. Okay, so that's about decoding, but how do we even train these things uh, to start with? Uh, because remember, I told you that the um, this um, 
programs or logical forms are latent, right? So this is where I said it. I said, uh, usually we don't have data that has these logical forms. And remember when we do sequence to sequence, we have both our inputs and outputs. We have that parallel corpora where you are supervising your model to generate these outputs by giving models supervision of, no, you should have generated this instead of that. But if you don't have logical forms, how do you approach this sequence to sequence part? And, and we will not talk about details of that. That's again, uh, similar to CCG, although not as complicated as CCG, not something uh, that's uh, super simple. And uh, here today, I want to go over more things and kind of cover the breadth of the things rather the depth. So if we had supervision, our sequence to sequence approach, super simple. We are doing what exactly what we have done for machine translation, right? We are encoding our input, for example, here, flights from Dallas leaving after four in the afternoon. So here you are talking with some agent and when you want uh, uh, all of such flights. And um, here, in, you know, you can imagine that some kind of uh, agent has a database where all the flights are listed that will happen to, you know, that can happen in a year. And we can then, um, uh, search for those that are leaving Dallas uh, and that have uh, that are leaving after uh, 4 p.m., which is here uh, written in, uh, I, I don't know, European notation. I, I think, I don't know whether it's everywhere except U.S., but 16 is reference to 4 p.m. So here, then you can just generate um, token by token and have your standard cross entropy or negative log likelihood loss over each token. And then after you have generated all of them, average the losses over tokens and back propagate and uh, train in that fashion. Same way we have done for machine translation. However, as I said, what if you do not have this? Like, what do you do then? And uh, this becomes a problem known as weekly supervision, where you have what should be the output. So here, which at least was from South Korea after 2010, you know the answer, Kim Yoo Na, uh, and you are gonna use the loss with respect to uh, predicting the right answer and back propagate through components that are also producing these uh, logical forms, but you do not have them. So it's in that sense, it's a big supervision. The idea is that only if you have a good logical form, you could get the right answer. Uh, and you do not have information about whether the logical form was good or not. You only have information of whether the model managed to answer the, um, uh, the question well or not. So you use that kind of loss to go over all of the components of the model, including those that are generating the logical form. So, uh, the better the logical forms are, the better the answering part should be. And this is why weak supervision should work. Weak supervision goes beyond semantic parsing. It is whenever you have not direct supervision for a thing you want, and you have this pipeline where uh, something happens first, and then this next thing relies on the first thing, and you have the supervision for the second uh, thing, not the first one. Again, uh, I will not go into details of any of these algorithms. I'm happy to share more information with you on them offline. Uh, it goes beyond this uh, course, but there are ways to deal with um, the problem where you have uh, this kind of a pipeline I mentioned where something is generated and then, then you're doing the second subtask over the first one, but you have only supervision for the second one. It is a common problem in NLP and uh, there are certain algorithms you might deploy for them. Um, again, not gonna talk about that because that would be just a whole other sequence of lectures on how to deal with that. But I, you, you should just be aware that, okay, if I wanna do semantic parsing and I wanna generate this logical form, and if I don't have data, it's not the end, right? Like there are algorithms to deal with that. I also wanna mention that um, in the previous examples, everything was kind of not depending on interactions. We had like how many people live in Seattle, you can get the answer in just single interaction, right? But semantic parsing is very often 
promise for tasks where you would like to do something interactive. So take an example of um, that I have um, mentioned briefly about booking a flight. You know, you might have all these restrictions while you are looking for a flight. So you might start with like, okay, I want to fly from Salt Lake City to Zagreb. And then you get certain flights and you're like, oh, this departure time is really early. I don't want to wake up so early. So you ask the agent, okay, but how about same flights, but the departure time is after noon. Um, and then it gives you some options. And then you realize, all right, some of these are really expensive. So uh, how about all these flights, but you know, up to $2,000 or something like that. So you might have these uh, interactions that first of all, uh, they depend on previous instructions. Uh, like in this example I've just given you, I, I assume that the agent know that I already asked about flight to Zagreb, so I don't wanna repeat that information all the time. And uh, for the model, that means that it needs to keep uh, you know, uh, keep um, information about its interpretations of the instructions. And um, the the current, whatever happens in the actual world might change. So with maybe flights, it's not so clear, but for example, if you had a robot and uh, you know, you give one instruction and then the second things have changed. So what actually now happened in the environment of a robot and where it's positioned might look different. And that's something that the uh, the uh, the semantic parser needs to also take into account that the environment might change as well. Um, what kind of actions were taken? Um, here, um, I'm trying to think about um, um, uh, the uh, example. Um, again, with the uh, with the robot. Um, the robot had made certain turns, right? And uh, that's also something that uh, needs to be uh, considered. So semantic parsing, you know, when I showed you those first example might have seemed pretty straightforward, right? Like you have a sentence, a question, you find this logical form, okay, it's a little bit hard to actually produce it in a neural fashion if you don't have annotations of logical form, but that's not only challenge. Here, I'm trying to make a point that the uh, understanding of um, what everything, the meaning of instructions and how they come can become very complex. Um, this is an example I have uh, mentioned before where you have, uh, you know, you are booking a flight and then you have all these, uh, you know, turns and the model needs to take care of all the previous interactions and um, understand everything that has happened in this history. Um, and I just want to kind of briefly talked about what does this mean for modeling? Um, you could just say, well, maybe, yeah, maybe I should stop for a moment and ask you, let's say I wanna build a sequence, just a simple sequence to sequence approach. And um, I ask, show me all flights from Boston to Pittsburgh on Wednesday of next week, which depart from Boston after 5 p.m. And um, let's say the model responds, and then I have another request. So uh, the first response was decoded by a model using the coder part of it. What do I do in the next stage, in a next step where I have second instruction? And before that second instruction, I had first instruction and the model's response. What should be, in your opinion, the input to the model now? So the goal is to have second interaction where I'm now giving, um, uh, let's say this is my second second uh, question. Please describe the class of service I. So I have this uh, first um, instruction, the model had responded with something, and now I ask another instruction. What do I give to a model, a sequence to sequence model, for it to generate something after, please describe the class of service Y. Yes. Yeah, that's that's right. And um, can you tell me like, um, you're now constructing, you're programming a sequence of things. Like what do you, what are you putting in that string? And yes, I is important. 
But just because I don't know what exactly is the next thing here, I'm using this one as an example. So imagine I just had uh, this one and this is my second one and ignore that Y is mentioned, but yeah. So what would you put in the string? Gotcha. Okay, that's good. Um, what else is important? The previous uh, response as well, right? Yeah, and let's say I forbid you to use vector representations of previous things. So what could you do? Instead, like you just need to craft an input sequence. Okay, maybe you can. Maybe we can use some kind of that's a question, the previous question, answer, the previous answer, and now the next question is an answer for the blank. Yeah, so exactly. That would be the simplest way to now try to generate answer for the second instruction while keeping the history of the previous instruction. You just keep this. Um, here, uh, very long, like this input sequence is becoming longer and longer. So here we have show me flights next Monday. Um, and then um, the, mo the model um, on American Airlines. And um, the model is uh, responding the which ones, something, something. And you would just concatenate whatever the user had asked, what the agent has responded, what the user has asked and what the agent responded. It's just making the, making basically the whole conversation history is becoming larger and larger and you are just keeping this larger and larger string and giving it again to the model that then outputs the um, answer. And the issue is here that, well, um, we have already encoded the first instruction. And if we are in the end, you know, instruction, we have encoded all of the instructions and responses from the model. And as you mentioned, why not use that representation again? Um, so in these approaches, there are this whole line of work tries to see how we can keep the history of a conversation uh, in, a, in a vector and then use that vector and cram as much as we can in it without losing information. And then, um, you know, make the generation based on that vector and whatever is the new utterance. So the sequence doesn't become impossibly uh, large. And of course, I mean, with <laughs> transformers, with GPT-4, with context length being larger and larger to the point that it's, you know, you can put 32,000 tokens, if not more, in your input, um, this might seem like, okay, I don't need to know about these um, sophisticated ways of keeping history. And that might be true if you are planning to use uh, APIs and you don't want to build your model. But um, in reality, we all we still want to use, first of all, smaller models because uh, we want to do um, things fast or uh, we don't have the means to pay for APIs. So if you are stuck or willingly choose to use a medium-sized model and you need to find a way to model history and your context length is not enormous and with open source models is maybe two or 4,000 uh, tokens long, then you might opt for these approaches which are a more clever way of keeping history in a vector representation and attending that representation similar to when, you know, when we talked about the tension, how we describe like, pointing back to the to the history. Okay, so uh, that's as much as I wanted to talk about this kind of semantic parsing where you have um, some question or utterance and you wanna produce a logical form um, out of it and then execute it. For me, it's important that you know that semantic parsing as a task like defined as I just did uh, exists. Um, I want you to remember that previously historically, we have approached it with the CCG grammars and very complex discrete algorithms over CCG grammars. And that after 2016, we have uh, replaced that approach with the neural sequence to sequence approaches that we have learned when we talked about machine conditional uh, generation and machine translation. Um, for 
sequence to sequence approach for months now, we know that we need data, parallel data of inputs and outputs. And we can learn today that, well, for uh, semantic parsing, we might not always have that. However, we are not now disappointed and sad because there are certain algorithms to learn from weak supervision, meaning we have the final outcome of execution. We just don't have the logical form. We didn't talk about details of those algorithms. They are more involved, uh, nothing like terribly hard. You can all learn about it, but just beyond scope of this course. And in the last part, I mentioned that um, the semantic parsing can become very contextualized and very complex. And um, we focused on how to follow previous instructions where with sequence to sequence approach, if we you know totally brute force it, we would just keep the history in a longer and longer and longer string. You can literally imagine you start in Python with an empty string and you add plus, plus more strings and it becomes larger and larger and larger. And you are putting that larger and larger input to your sequence to sequence model, but that's not efficient or reasonable because we are certainly going to hit the maximum sequence length and therefore we can use some more clever approaches that are uh, trying to keep this history in a, in a vector representation effectively. So that said, uh, I want to step, take a step back and in this tutorial whose slides I am um, following and in this uh, slides in this tutorial you have way more details about these algorithms or anything. If you want to know more, this is the first place to go. Unfortunately, they don't have recording, so I'm a little bit stuck with like, okay, this is a slides, and I'm just going to try to see what the, you know, original people who created the slide wanted to say, but there is always a reference to the papers, and papers are a great way to get all the details you need. So in this, um, in this presentation, they uh, present this kind of way to illustrate uh, language to meaning. So from sentence to a representation of a meaning that goes from least to most informative. And again, what's most informative here is vague. Uh, and you know uh, there might be disagreements of whether semantic parsing is more informative in terms of meaning representation than something else to someone else. But what they want to say here is that with semantic uh, parsing, uh, it's the most informative in a sense that your logical form or the formal representation you produced must have everything you need to execute uh, the operation correctly. Like it has to be complete in a sense that has to have everything necessary for actually doing the thing that the instruction is saying to do. So the, the representation is very often has this kind of either uh, you know, programmatic looking way, like in a programming language, even like Python, or it is in a, in a logic. And to them, least informative, and here least informative for executing is what is called broad coverage semantics, where you're trying to find the representation of the input, which has, um, it should have everything you need to have for uh, finding some kind of structure of structure uh, of meaning, but uh, here it should cover many many things, and maybe that's too much for uh, for a very specific task you're trying to do. Here uh, is a robot. You need to really just a representation to tell you how to move. You know, three steps ahead and then turn to the left or here to the right. Um, and then there is least informative, which is here an example of information extraction, where you just want to find entities and relation between them. And having that information, that captures some aspect of the meaning, but it can't be used for then, you know, applying it to do, um, you know, for a robot to follow instructions. So if now this, what I'm trying to illustrate here, it doesn't really sit well with you are like, well, what's more informative, what's not? It's it's not that much of, uh, uh, important. I want you to kind of see that there are all these representations people have been using that have more or less information about the meaning structure of the input, and they might be used for different kinds of tasks. 
And what we are going to focus on the, in the rest of the lecture is this uh, something something in between where we don't actually have this um, executor and we don't really need this really specific uh, formal logical thing written for someone to execute. Rather, we have some uh, representation of meaning, which gives us some uh, pretty broad coverage of what's happening uh, in the sentence. And this brings me to, to what the idea of uh, shallow semantic parsing, which is uh, one, one type of um, task and linguistic structure that's uh, relevant for it is so-called semantic role labeling. Okay, let's start with what is semantic role labeling. Uh, here I'm gonna use slides by uh, Vivek uh, again. So for a event that is described in a word, uh, different noun phrases fulfill different so-called semantic roles. So I'm trying to define semantic roles, but I just mentioned phrase semantic roles, so uh, bear with me. Uh, so uh, let's go over an example. Here we have a sentence, John saw Mary eat the apple. And we have um, invent is another, it's a, it's a linguistic term, but it's also not super well defined and there are differences in opinion of what constitutes an event so for you think about it for now as a verb and here we have so uh verb so which is you can think about this as a reference to a seeing uh event and different noun phrases here by now we know what noun phrases are which is great um different noun phrases are gonna fulfill represent different um uh, like arguments, we say arguments for this uh, word. Basically, um, let me give you an example. For example, here, John is an entity that is performing the seeing ac action. So uh, the, the argument uh, that John fulfills here for this word is uh, that he's doing the action of seeing. So he's actor in this uh, in this sentence where the second noun phrase, Mary eat the apple, um, this is a thing that's being seen. So this is argument of what is being seen by, uh, by John. Uh, we have another verb here, eat. Eat, uh, which entity is performing uh, eating? Here, Mary is performing eating and uh, the apple is the thing that's being eaten. So for th these verbs, so and eat, we have seen different noun phrasing playing different roles for these uh, verb. Some of them are doing the action uh, that's expressed with this verb and other things are being uh, affected by this action. And semantic role labeling is loosely speaking, the task of identifying who does what to whom, when, where and why. And before we could do like question answering directly, you can imagine how knowing that information uh, would be useful for them doing question answering. Because here, if we had the sentence, who is eating the apple and you have uh, no information that uh, agent of the action eating is Mary here, you can then use that information to retrieve uh, the answer to the question, who is eating the apple? So historically, semantic role labeling has been really tied with the task of question answering as well. So more formally, input will be a sentence and a verb. You need to specify which verb because uh, different verbs will have different phrases in the input being their arguments. As we have just seen with uh, John is the person seeing while Mary is the person who is uh, eating. And um, what you wanna do uh, with semantic role labeling is to output a list of labeled spans. This pens should represent the arguments that participate in the event, such as John and Mary eating apple. And the labels should represent the semantic role of each argument. And we'll see frameworks that define this semantic role for us. So here, uh, if we were more specific, we also need to specify in which framework do we do semantic role labeling. We'll see two, because then the labels for the argument will differ. Remember when we talk about universal dependencies, and I mentioned there are other dependencies, it all, or part of speech tagging, which tagging you want to do dependent on the tag set you are 
given. It's also the same here with SRL. So you will see people um, specify we are doing SRL in this specific framework and that specification is important. Um, optionally, we also need to give uh, the word with the frame type, which uh, describes the action. Um, which is in a way like a word sense uh, disambiguation. If we have a word that may have two uh, senses, then we can specify what exactly this frame, frame uh, verb refers to, which is useful if you have that information, which we do in certain frameworks. All right, so all right, so um, I kind of went on a tangent here when I talked about when we give a label to spam and we say, well, you are this kind of an argument where, where this label must come from somewhere. And uh, it is not easy to define the set of labels that can be uh, potential arguments. So um, some examples are here. We can, might have, I think the first thing that might come to your mind is the semantic role of an agent. That's the entity who initiates an event such as John in the sentence, John cut an apple with a knife, right? That's the person doing the action. Um, then there is something that is affected by this uh, action that or that undergoes a change of state and we refer to this role as a patient. So here, John cut an apple with a knife. An apple is a thing that is being affected by cutting operation and changes upon we cut it. We have instrument uh, that can be a thing we use to perform the action, such as knife here, or a location where the action is taking place, which is on the table here. So semantic role labeling with this label set would mean, well, given a verb, and here I'm giving you a verb cut, find me all spans that are arguments of the word uh, verb cut, which would be John, apple, knife on the table, and not only that, but you need to label each one of these extracted phrases. And then we would label John with agent, Apple with patient, knife as an instrument, and on the table as location. And if we had that information, we can be then ready to answer questions that are of the spirit, who did what, to whom, and how, right? Because now we have basically all the information to answer that question. And you know, it's not nearly as complete. There are many other things you could be defining here uh, as, a, as an argument, which brings me to different kind of choices of labels. Um, basically the semantic labels can be super fine grained or they can be super broad. In FrameNet, um, we have semantic rules that are, first of all, they are based on a theory of frame semantics. And if this sounds interesting to you, you should definitely check Fillmore's work. That was uh, the basis for uh, FrameNet. And here, the, the labels in FrameNet are usually more fine-grained and the verbs themselves um, um, are relating to very different set of semantic rules. So it is more specific. Um, it is therefore harder to annotate and usually has, it's more daunting for people to work on the task like that. That has very, very fine grained uh, roles and uh, examples might look very different from each other. On the other hand, uh, ProBank is um, theory neutral, but in uh, here we have very abstract labels, argument zero, argument one, whatever that means, right? And what is argument zero, argument one, we define on a word by a word uh, basis. We don't have actually a, a lexicon or a database where given, uh, given a verb we have, okay, these are the semantic roles, possible semantic roles for that specific verbs. And here are examples of those semantic uh, roles for that specific word. Very often in research, you will see more of prop bank SRL because it's easier and there is more data for it than frame. But because as we'll see by the end of this lecture, prop bank SRL in English has become, um, it, it, the performance has saturated. It's not of the interest so much anymore. So you will see today people working on frame net and how to improve uh, performance on a framework uh, semantic role labeling uh, more than on prop bank. 
yeah, so FrameNet and Broadbank, these things should mean something to you. So these are very common. Like people will say, oh, you should just check FrameNet or oh, that's in Broadbank. So uh, these are not some niche resources. These are very central resources for doing this kind of work in uh, NLP. And um, again, if you go to an NLP conference, someone might just throw it at you assuming you know what they are. So uh, definitely remember them. All right, so let's see difference between FrameNet and ProBank. Uh, here we have uh, two uh, different frames. So both, where both will be part of a frame in FrameNet called Commerce Good Transfer. So you see how specific it is, right? It's very, very specific. And then for Commerce Goods Transfer frame in FrameNet, you will have the roles buyer, goods, and seller. On the other hand, acquired, where the acquire will be uh, in a frame uh, acquire in FrameNet, which is, okay, not surprising. Um, and then for that uh, frame, you will have a recipient team or a source. So the roles change from verb to verb, right? Uh, on the other hand, here is how these, uh, how these, um, roles look for the same sentences in problem. So we have basically um, whatever is the subject for both acquired and returned will be argument zero, which is as I, you know, a few slides ago, I mentioned an agent. Argument zero, very often for ProBank, SRL has the notion of who is doing this action. And then object will all very often be argument one what is being affected by the uh, action which we described as a patient. Uh, but then uh, from or to Mary, uh, it's all going to be labeled as argument zero, where you might have, you know, uh, it, this is a seller here or it's a source. What is the exact meaning of that argument zero is lost in probing. All right. So, uh, yeah, and I mean, maybe I didn't highlight this enough. Like, you here with ProBank, you will label this with argument zero, but what exactly argument zero means for each one of these sentences is not explicit with ProBank. So you need to do this extra step of interpretation, which also means that it might be a difficulty if you want to build a question answering system on top of it, right? Where here, uh, if I ask you a question, who who is a who is a seller? Let's say. Um, who bought, um, who, excuse me, who is selling a glove? Knowing that Mary is a seller, we can easily answer that, okay, Mary is selling uh, a glove. Whereas here, if you have argument zero, uh, we might need to do extra steps and write extra rules to be able to do that kind of answering I have just uh, mentioned. Okay, so we are going to go over what was the state of the art for before neural networks and then go into uh, neural approaches for uh, semantic labeling. And we won't go into details again of uh, what are, how people approach SRL before. I just wanna give you, uh, show examples where um, this becomes more difficult inference uh, problems. Okay, as I mentioned before, mo most people have worked on ProBank because of its uh, simplicity. So uh, again, uh, here we have, you need to tell to your model which is the verb you are interested in. And then uh, for heading, the bus was heading from Nairobi in Kenya. Uh, there we want to label what are uh, A0 and A1. And again, we need to mentally do interpretation of what argument zero and argument one means for heading. So for heading here, uh, we uh, we might describe a zero as uh, what is being moving and a, is a one, what is the destination? But it's on a case by case basis. When we move to another word, a one, a zero and a one will mean different thing as we have seen previously with buyer and seller, for example. Okay, but you only care about given a verb, you want to, you know, as a model, it only needs to tell you spans, which are arguments for that verb and the labels of those arguments. It doesn't need to give you interpretation of A0 and A1. This is something uh, you as a developer are uh, doing. 
Okay, so the first step um, is to identify candidate arguments for verb using parse tree. Uh, mentioned before, I pre previously mentioned there, subject is very often A0 and object is very often A1. This is an information you can use, right? You can use your dependency parser, assuming it has high performance, you can instruct what are subjects and objects of the verb, and this can be your candidates for uh, argument zero and one for probe bank. Um, then once you have your candidates and you, you, you will do also some extra step of filtering, but then each one of your candidates has to be labeled, right? We need to label them as A0 or A1, and depending how many labels we have, that many classes we will also have. So this is multi-class uh, classification. And then finally, at the inference time, you will have some information of which are, okay, which one of these are more likely than the other, like which are, uh, whether this uh, should be included or not, and which label is more likely than the other, you will have that as we had seen uh, previously in many cases, and you will do that to use, um, to, to do the final decision of what are the uh, phrases that should be extracted as an argument for this verb and which labels we should be giving them. However, uh, there are some, some uh, constraints here, uh, such as that arguments should not be overlapping for a given verb. So let's say um, we have two spans, uh, one is a subset of the other, we should not be extracting both of those as an argument of a verb under this formalism. So there are some structural constraints that we need to uh, consider. For example, here uh, in this visualization, um, uh, we have um, each one of these bars. Um, so this bar, uh, these bars over here represent uh, are associated with the bus. So that's why they are this long because they stop here. Uh, here for Nairobi in Kenya, this is these bars that represent that span. For Nairobi, represented with these things, and in Kenya, represented with this. So for each one of these phrases, uh, we have um, some probability distribution of um, whether um, they are arguments or not for this work. So here, um, we have these high probabilities for, um, let me just see what the, okay. Uh, bu -bu. Uh, just a moment, I need to, I forgot what the, um, what, did it, uh, what the probability distribution is over, because if it's over, whether we include them as uh, candidates or not, it should be binary decision. So I'm confused why there are four or five of them. Uh, Okay. Okay, so I, I don't know why, uh, like uh, here the task is just to determine whether they are the um, arguments or not. So in, in my mind, this should be distribution over two values, not over five, over two values, whether we include it as an argument or not included. So I'm a little bit confused of why we have a distribution of five possibilities. That would make sense if we have five possible semantic roles, but here we are not uh, actually doing the labeling. So I'm slightly confused, but I can still uh, give you the point I'm trying to make here. And that point is that um, if you are doing these decisions independently and um, you have uh, checked whether we should be including the phrase or not, uh, by the probability of, you know, should be included is higher than probability of not including it as an argument of the verb heading here, you might end up with including for, for Nairobi and for Nairobi in Kenya. And the structural constraint I have mentioned is that we should not be allowing that the arguments for a given verb overlap with each other. So this is one of these should be uh, eliminated which is then uh, done using these inference procedures where you say, well, uh, I should not be including one of these. So I will uh, disallow one of them and include only, uh, only uh, the next one. Um, so this is an example where you, you are having this problem of this struct, 
similar to constraint decoding we have seen with semantic parsing before, you have uh, you are making these decisions which are just binary or monthly class classifiers, but then you are also adding these special constraints uh, during the inference time. So you might use something like if pre-neural time, something like integer linear programming, for example, to uh, use these uh, constraints that I you know, just briefly mentioned, such as not, arguments should not be overlapping for a single word. And before you know, neural model, we had a bunch of handcrafted features. As I mentioned, we have, uh, for example, usage of our parse trees. Uh, here we have constituency parse tree where uh, we can use the rule over the parse tree to determine what is the subject. And therefore uh, that's gonna be the um, certain argument of uh, the verb. Uh, more easily would be to use the, use the dependency parsing, right? Uh, but besides looking at the features of our dependency or constituency parse trees, there were many, many, uh, many handcrafted features to be able to do something like this before neural approaches. Uh, and this would result in many million dimensional feature vectors, right? So that's huge and usually that would be sparse. Remember when we talked about word embeddings being short? I think this is a great example of like, yeah, 300 dimensional vector is high dimensional vector, but relative to many millions dimensional vector is pretty short. Um, yeah, and you know, I, I, how, how do we do uh, this learning with the, with, you know, these structures? Um, uh, but, yeah, basically want to train a model that learns to assign a score for the entire sentence rather than one label at a time. So you want to give a notion of like, okay, you should make, be making these decisions together rather like if you make this decision for this span, this affects the decision of this other span. Uh, and there are ways how you could uh, do that with structured learning. All right, so how did these things perform? Well, before neural approaches, they were kind of uh, reaching this uh, eight-ish range, and for nearly ten years, there was no really big change in performance. And then, uh, with neural uh, approaches, things uh, have uh, changed. So um, here we'll just go over a few examples of why. Why is this hard? Why was it so hard to push above this barrier of eighty uh, percent F one score? And then we'll see uh, just how people then approach this in end-to-end -end fashion. And the paper, I think it's named end-to-end -end semantic row labeling was a major uh, success. All right, so uh, there is a wide variety of phenomena. Here we have John frightened the raccoon with the big tail. And again, our, I think, example of PP attachment, which we love, John frightened the raccoon with the big stick. The raccoon didn't have a big stick, but honestly, they totally could have. Uh, They're so scary. Um, so again, here, what is the span of the argument one, again, depends on our in understanding of the right PP attachment, right? Because we could easily have a wrong PP attachment in the second sen sentence that says, said, well, argument one should be the argument with, um, excuse me, the raccoon with a big stick, which is, which would be wrong. Uh, dependencies can be, uh, very far away. And then if we are having can design features that depend on the quality of the trees, that's going to become a problem. Although we have seen that with dependency parsing, things are better. So we could have a very simple, John frightened the raccoon, everything is right next to each other. Or we can have John walk quietly into the garden and frightened the raccoon. So now John is very far away from the verb uh, frightened. Although with, you know, now that you know about dependency parsing, you should be like, whatever, this is also just one dependency relation away from the uh, from the frightened. But constituency parse three wouldn't work so neatly. And remember that dependency parsing kind of came later uh, after constituency. And here we are talking about what had happened uh, 15 years ago. Um, here we have John broke the vase and uh, uh, the vase uh, broke. And now uh, that you know rule, okay, subject is gonna be the uh, the, um, the 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 argument zero is not really gonna work. So if you have active or passive voice, your rules are also gonna be uh, different. So, and we are now entering neural era. 
where things uh, this is a this is a slide we have seen before where things haven't changed for many many years and we were kind of stuck at the 80% F1 accuracy on ProBank SRL. And then um, in 2017, um, end-to-end -end semantic role labeling came out and this is how we can approach semantic role labeling with a neural network. This brings me, is, gives me so much nostalgia. When we were writing papers in 2017, we would also draw these little architectures now we all use transformers and you would never put on a, a, like a you know diagram of your architecture anymore because everyone knows exactly what the architecture is but in that that you know then, back then we had to draw all these little boxes and arrows and explain how we design neural net um which is a total digression but yeah um so we would put a sentence as an input, of course, but we would also need to give an information to the neural network of where the verb, the predicate is. So here you would have a special extra indicator feature to say this is the verb, and otherwise you would represent your uh, words with, give me an example. If we are dealing with neural networks, what could be a representation of each word? Oh, quickly. Embeddings. Embeddings. Give me an example of an embedding, concrete one. Word to vec. Perfect. We would say, okay, I'm going to use word to vec embedding for each one of the words. I'm going to use 300 dimensional vectors. I have read somewhere that they are pretty good. And I'm going to uh, concatenate um, a zero vector or just an integer zero if, you know, word is not the verb I'm interested in. And one if the verb is uh, the verb I am interested to know the rules of. And then you would have your deep neural network, whatever one you like. Here they have also these extra residual connections that we have also in transformers. And at the end, you would have a representation for each one of these words that depends on the previous context. And then you would use the BIO notation that we have introduced for NER. Because here again, the arguments can be spans of multiple words. So you need to tell this is the beginning and this is the end of the uh, span. And each one of these will have associated argument labels. So you hear it would start with B dash R zero, meaning this is the beginning of a span that's argument uh, zero for this word. Super simple, right? And um, yeah, these are basically things I said. So, you know, in 2017, there were still a few moving pieces uh, that we had to he he figure out like highway connections or residual connections. It's the same thing. Constrained inference was still a thing. Uh, people who use product of experts that were trained uh, multiply, multiple randomly initialized networks and then average them. That was very uh, useful to account for how bad your initial initialization was these days not super important because we have pre-training um, stability was a, and generalization was bigger issue than when we had pre-trained models so you would use uh, dropout with higher rates uh, and uh, and so on so things were a little bit more complicated than uh, when we entered the pre-training uh, era and I will just give an illustration of how we used for example BERT. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to show that for ages, you know, look at this, from 2005 to, to 2015, the performance basically was uh, similar uh, for 10 years. And then in two years, you have 4% uh, improvement, which is very, it, it was very exciting for people. I remember that these previous approaches had used millions of hand-designed features where uh, this approach uh, just uses word to work embeddings, I mean, glove embeddings in their case, and does everything in end-to-end -end fashion. So, you know, this was this was one of those pivotal moments where a task people really cared about, semantic role labeling was something people really, really cared about, has suddenly had this massive jumps in also end-to-end -end fashion. So without, you know, any kind of human uh, interventions. Um, in the sense of, you know, this is a feature you should know, but still people have designed the architecture and that's also human uh, intervention to not be forgotten. 
And of, uh, today, uh, I was looking at what is the state of the art in ProBank. Finding state of the art is so hard, and we should be designing a task where you know the, the whole goal is given all the literature and the world to give me the state of the art uh, for a given data set. If you're interested, talk to me. We'll need to figure this out. But I found that 88.8 .8 is basically the state of the art uh, on ProBank, English ProBank uh, right now. And I have found this number in this paper by Shea and Lin in 2019. So I don't know whether people have played around with this further. It's imaginable it's even higher today. But in this paper, this is how they use BERT to do SRL and how they achieve 88 performance, uh, almost 89. So they give a sentence in a standard way you would give to BERT, starting with a special CLS token, right? And to indicate which verb it, they are interesting in knowing the rules for, they are putting these separator tokens around the verb. And again, as before, we are just approaching everything in end-to-end -end fashion. We just put this sentence like this in BERT, and we again use the BIO notation we have seen before. And just doing that would give you uh, 89 perform 89 F1 scores. So I think here, because the difference between um, approach I have just described in 2017 and this one is very minimal. It's a, the, just a change of architecture. I think we can contribute this additional uh, four to 5% uh, improvements to pre-training, which is, I, I wish retrospectively when I was talking about pre-training that I showed you some numbers to see how big these jumps were. And then uh, again, you can now contextualize what the performance we have to, in 2019, it's 9% um, higher than what we had in uh, four years before, while ten, for 10 years before that, we didn't make any improvements. So this is why people um, you know, in NLP and adjacent fields are so um, became so wild with the idea of doing everything in end-to-end -end fashion and where, where these more you know, structured approaches has, have lost their uh, magic. Okay, so that brings us at uh, 110. So let's stop here and uh, yeah, I'll see you all on Wednesday.